Next on the panel, we have Ashwin Suresh, ladies and gentlemen, founder of Pocket Aces. Prior to founding Pocket Aces, Ashwin was the creative head at Jungle Pictures, Times of India Group's film studio, which he set up in year 2013. Previously, he was with creative executive at Reliance Entertainment, where he produced a variety of Hindi feature films. May I request Ashwin Suresh to also join us here on the panel as we talk about day-to-day -day challenges for change makers of online video industry. With this, I hand it over to you, Vishal. Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, I think the audience are going to have a great time because uh, you're going to hear from two, actually three, one of them is uh, seated outside, three amazing entrepreneurs who actually started off as friends in college. Uh, and they've been able to build something extraordinary. Uh, they have possibly raised the least amount of capital in the content space, but today their company has uh, dominance of content not only on YouTube, but also on platforms like Netflix where they've been able to publish stuff. I'm sure you're already aware of Loco, which is their game show, uh, which has massive traction. And all this has been done in a very short amount of time. So I think my first question to these guys is, how have you been able to do this with such little capital? So I think every one of you wants to know that secret. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, we both used to be investors before, and I think somewhere, you know, we were investors also. We were investors in uh, private equity um, businesses. We were basically both working in finance uh, for a while in the U.S. and Europe and the Middle East for in Anirudh's case. Uh, so we've understood the value of you know uh, investor capital and how to use that effectively. Uh, we also, for very you know service. Uh, background middle class families who um, have thought about kind of you know entrepreneurship which is very unusual for for you know people in our family uh, so we've always wanted to build a business that is sustainable that has really good unit economics that is profitable that can make money uh, so we've been very efficient with our use of capital um, how we've achieved scale has been through the fact that you know we've always been very insight driven um, you know everybody has data everybody looks at data but what kind of insights can you draw from that and how does that inform your content selection or your content decisions? Uh, we've, from the get-go, always placed that emphasis and decentralized it. So unless, unlike having a central you know, intelligence team that sits and gives the writers and directors some information, says, is pe video banao, is pe, you know, story likho, um, we've let the creators themselves do that. Um, we've given access to data. It's transparent at the company. And everybody comes up with insights, and those insights are challenged or tested. Yeah, and I think if you look at India, usage is cheap to buy. Retention is not easy. Um, and I think when your core thesis of a product is just usage, you need to have retention. And we've thought about that very long and hard for any product that we've built, uh, whether it's uh, loco or you know filter copy or all these things. We actually got the mix right before splurging on marketing. And the second thing is the DNA of the company still remains, like you said, iterative. So we still make videos with phones. So it's not like now that we are such a big creator, Filter Copy is one of the biggest uh, names in digital media. It's not that now we're shooting on a red camera or something that costs lakhs of rupees a day. We still shoot on uh, phones because we know that's the beauty of the model. So I think not forgetting that is really important. And, um, and yeah, so that's why we've been able to do it with the kind of so, capital we so have. So all the creators have pretty much access to the same analytics which YouTube or anybody else provides. So what is it that you are seeing in that analytics which others are not able to see? Uh, see, I think having data is great, but it's kind of useless by itself, right? Uh, there needs to be a culture at every organization of drawing insights from that data. And there needs to be training at the very, very grassroots level on how to do that. So, you know, we've always hired creators fresh out of college. We've hired people who have not come with industry learnings or established preconceived notions. Uh, we have taught them how to think about so, so you like mine the con the comments or yeah it can be as manual as mining the comments and you know noting down how many times a certain word was used uh, or using technology to do that or it could be as high level as looking at a retention curve and looking for drop off points and trying to analyze why the content uh, led to drop off there um, but the key differentiator for us is that it happens at the creator level which means the writer who, somebody who graduated from college six months ago is now sitting and doing that thinking. It's not some creative head or content head who's telling him or her to do this. A good case in point recently happened. Uh, one of our Dice Media shows, 
um, which just launched recently called Home Sweet Office on Dice Media's YouTube channel. Um, the, the marketing team uh, was looking through the data to understand kind of which parts of content works in our historical shows. And they noticed that every time we have a very long title sequence, there's a bit of a drop off and then it comes back up. And so they went to the, the graphic design team, which is responsible for creating these very nice elaborate uh, title sequences. And it's blasphemy to go tell a creative team, don't do your job, right? Because your job is not valuable. But they went to them and said, here's what the data is saying, that this, you know, this program, this piece of the program, people skip over if they find that it's too long. So limit your creative uh, you know, involvement to a six second period or a five second period. That's a small change. By itself, that change doesn't impact the business. But when you make hundreds of those decisions on a daily basis and hundreds of people are making them, that's where the value gets created. Yeah, I also think like, you know, one of my kind of favorite people to follow in the world is Warren Buffett. He says investing is actually not that difficult, but doing those things day in and day out is difficult. I mean, we've sat in a thousand panels and told people how we make our content. It's actually out there in any article you read about us, you know, we take, an, take a piece of content, make it for cheap, get insights from it, then build long form content. Yet people don't do it because it doesn't sit well with their process and they break it after a point of view, a point of time. So data just remains a word on an investor deck, not things that actually people use. And, you know, having now built a full tech product from scratch, I think that same applies for engineers and product managers as well. They just do not look at the data. And because sometimes it doesn't sit well with you. It doesn't go with the way you think personally. And I think one of the uh, key things we say in our company is it's much more important to be successful than to be right. Yeah. Most people want to just prove themselves right. So, but just to kind of take your same argument, uh, in the past there, were these, there was this term called content farm. They used to do this with blogs uh, when you know, predominantly internet had textual content and they were like, you know, AI was writing headlines and stories and things like that. And of course, it did work to an extent, but later on, you know, the AI just could not match the creativity. So how much of your stuff is AI or I'm just using analytics and how much of it is then creativity? No, I, I think the fundamental truth is data is unsexy. Data is boring. And uh, people often romanticize the idea and, you know, people come up with absurd notions that data can create content for you and insights can do that. I think um, we also should not deny the fact that we are in the creative business and therefore it is an art. Um, the question is how much of uh, influence can your insights have on that creative? So, so, so just to in interject on that, right? So let's say you have 10 pieces of content. Typically for any creator, it is the, you know, 80, 20 or 60, 40, there will be, you know, some content which will do well. So in your case, is it similar or is it different? No, it's 80, 20 towards content that does well. And it's not because we're some creative genius. It's because the process is the same and there's a rigor applied to the process. So I wouldn't even say 80, 20, I'd say it goes far as to say 95, 5. Um, because the, there is consistent results. It's not that, I mean, yeah, we have some outliers. There's an occasional video that'll do 50 million views organically. And so all. guys, 95% of their content is blockbuster content. That's amazing. Yeah, but the key is not that it's blockbuster, but the fact that it's consistently, at a, it's predictable, and we know what it's going to do. And, because and, and that's rare. I mean, in a medium like creative, you know, where you're cre telling stories, coming up with such high degree of content, which is going to get... Yeah, hits because if you think about it, in the business, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand the distribution medium that we're using. Remember, we use all third-party distribution mediums, right? Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp. And to understand that distribution medium and know with pretty high assurity how much you're going to be able to generate there so that you can monetize accordingly. You don't so want I, a situation... I now understand why your company is called Pocket Aces because you seem to just have too many aces up your <laughs> sleeves. No, right? but, but look at this situation, right? If I made a video, let's say I told an advertiser or a brand that you give me so much money, I'll make you a video and it'll get a million views. Aayenge. But I generate 10 million views. It's actually not a great thing. That means I've left money on the table. That means I haven't been able to predict the performance of that content. Yes, occasionally outliers no, will no, happen. No, just a counter argument there, right? And I know this is a big debate between YouTubers of the famous YouTube algorithm, which is pushing you and not pushing you. So maybe it's just the YouTube algorithm and maybe it'll stop pushing you. Yeah, occasionally that happens. We do have outliers. We, I mean, our first video was an outlier when we had no likes on the page, no subscribers, our video did 8 million views. You can't plan that. You can't expect that. But the key is that consistency. The key is to basically generate repeatability and success. Yeah, I, I just want to come on the algorithm because the algorithm, like any market, changes. 
and people don't have, when you're a single YouTuber without a tech team, without a data team, you don't know what's actually impacting the numbers. And why is it that on Facebook we are consistently beating other people? It's not because, uh, you know, it's just the algorithm, because the algorithm has actually changed. And people lost a lot of numbers in January last year when actually they said, let's make 95% retention really important. But people don't even realize that happened. So they're just like, so if you hear any standard YouTuber, and that's why I don't call ourselves a YouTuber as such, as a company, it's like, ha, I put some content and it goes away. When I make it with my heart, it goes very well. When I make it with my mind, it doesn't go away. When I make it with my heart, it's a very unstructured process. And we have made the distribution and the cuts a science. And the way we make it a science is not that the computer tells us what to do. But after we make a few videos, because they're cheap, we start seeing the numbers and say, let's cut this. So one of the things we did, just give you an example, is on Facebook, none of our videos have, you know, XYZ presents Flana serial. It doesn't say that. Because we saw that the retention just drops. And because it auto plays, you need to ensure that, you know, in the three seconds, you give them something to watch. So are you doing A-B testing also then? In this yeah, case? we do do that all the time. We see what works better. And we use Instagram, for example, right now, a lot to do that. So when people see a meme from Filter Copy, which is now the biggest, you know, digital creator on Instagram, they feel like, ha ha, it's a joke. But actually, it's our Dice Media team telling the Filter Copy team that, hey, man, can you check out if this joke works? What are people saying in the comments? So the writer now gets instant feedback. That process is just missing in most companies. And we've done it now. See, Snapchat mentioned us in their uh, uh, annual uh, earnings release this year. As the creator that has that they've had the most success with when they launched. Why did that happen? Because our shows are cut differently for Snapchat, and it'll be fun to watch on Snapchat. Guys, you should not be running video, but you should be running gaming companies. And that's <laughs> what you're already doing, right? You're <laughs> <laughs> so with Loco, you have made the leap from video, which is YouTube and Facebook, to the world of gaming. So, so how did you think about Loco, and how did that happen? Yeah, I think, you know, we looked at... We look at content verticals all the time, right? To understand where we wanted to... And, and the, the icon of Loco, is there a story behind that also? Yeah, there's actually an interesting story there. Uh, it's so not, I'll, it's I'll not based on me, just... <laughs> <laughs> it's a coincidental resemblance. Um, no, no, what we did, you know, we, we were actually looking at the game show vertical as such. We looked at food, we launched Gobble in 2016. In 2016 itself, we looked at the game show vertical and said, how do we create really fun game show experiences for people through Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, whatever. So we did these live video game shows on Facebook during, uh, it was the World Cup T of the T20 World Cup that was happening in Bangladesh, I believe. And we had this experience where, you know, we'd have these hosts do live video and ask people to predict how many runs will Kohli score in this next over. And they would write in the comments and we would tell them, yeah, shout out to, you know, uh, Mohammad Amir for getting this right or for Rahul, you know, Sharma for getting this wrong. And really that saw so much engagement that we felt that the limitation that the existing platforms, Facebook, YouTube had with interactivity forced us to build our own platform that solved that problem. It wasn't really a decision to go get into building a, an app as such. And the content vertical led us there. And to be honest, it was an adjacency because it was a live video gaming platform. So for the longest time, uh, in fact, before Hotstar had the blowout IPL last year, we were the, you know, the highest uh, concurrent live streaming video platform in India. And in fact, outside of America and China in the world. I think one other thing which, you know, I really want to commend your team that you are also among the few people who were able to come on a platform to, uh, like Netflix without having vulgar jokes or without having, you know, content which was questionable because previously that was the kind of content which was going there. So you actually created a whole series out there on a platform like Netflix. How was it for, for you to convince them? Because Netflix is working at one end with, you know, big production houses, Karan Johar and all of that, and then they are signing up with you. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the things with the Netflix story is everyone thinks everything is an instant success. Oh, you guys were yesterday, nobody, now today you're someone. So it happened overnight. And every overnight success has taken time. And I think that's another thing about our team, right? We see opportunity when others are not seeing it. And we're early to these things so that when it arrives, we are ready with the right product. So we were actually, we wrote to Netflix when we had one show out. And we're like, guys, you're going to come to India, right? At some point. Here's a show. Look at the content quality of the show. It's a mockumentary you know, which no Indians have not seen mockumentaries. Now someone's releasing a remake of The Office. We did an original mockumentary in, at that time. 
And so we kept following up with Netflix. And um, so I think, again, that shows a DNA that I think a lot of people don't have. Uh, you, know, this, you know, they'll hear a no, and then that's it. That's the end of the conversation. Yeah, I, th I think the other thing that's important to note is that what was in it for Netflix, right? Yeah. Um, Netflix was coming into a market where uh, YouTube had very high penetration, as did a few other platforms, local ones. And how does it mobilize at that price point a large number of people to go off of one of these platforms or at least to add Netflix as a platform of choice? Um, we became a natural extension for that strategy because, you know, when a show like Little Things was getting, you know, 50, 60 million views, uh, there's a huge, huge fan following. You know, Mithila Palkar and Dhruv Sekhal have become pretty uh, popular names within a certain uh, community and certain demographic. Uh, so for Netflix, it was an opportunity to, you know, to sort of uh, almost move them over, port them to, to some extent. Um, so there was a good opportunity for them as well. So quickly, you know, the general impression is that it's very difficult to raise capital if you're a content creator. You know, it's been, you know, for the last few years, no major content creator has got like any major amount of funding. So what is your advice to people on A, how to raise money and B, how to not spend the money they have raised and <laughs> still continue to make good products. We've raised less than all up here, so we should ask them how to raise. <laughs> Clearly, we don't know how to raise. Um, no, look, I, I think uh, you have to have a, f you know, the business has to have some strong fundamentals and you have to have a belief that you're playing out. Um, we believed in kind of mobile consumption. We believed in social media content recommendation. Uh, and we believe there was a monetizable business or a pro potential profitable business around that. And we translated that to investors. The ones that understood participated, the ones that uh, didn't agree or didn't understand uh, declined. And that's just the nature of it. Well, fantastic. I think uh, your story is outstanding. And I think everybody here uh, should take inspiration from you because you were outsiders who came into the industry. You're not creators yourself. I mean, not creators in the sense you're not from the background, but you used your skills, analytical skills and... Um, everything to create such an amazing business. Congratulations thank for you. all your success. Thank, thank you. you. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. May I request Subrat to please join us here on the stage and help us in felicitating our panelists and our moderator. Thank you, Vishal, for moderating the session. Thank you, Anirudh. Thank you, Ashwin, for your valuable viewpoints that you've shared with us today. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen, for our wonderful panelists and our fantastic moderator of the session, wherein we talked about day-to-day -day challenges for change makers of online video industry. Can we hear a round of applause for them? Come on, everyone. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you again.